Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And I realize that some of you have maybe in your translation, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And just so you know, the actual text, is the, the same word is used. This is not one of those where, you know, we've kind of, some of our translations have been, what do you want to say, neuterized or whatever, changed, you know, the pronouns moved around. This one really fits. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. The actual word that's being used there is children. So it's not just sons, though son is, that, is a special term too. So I just want you to know, we're all included in this if we're a peacemaker. So who is a peacemaker? So for the last two weeks, we've been at uh, the corner of, and this is an advertisement by the way, the Rotary Club has been at the corner of Lake Gregory Drive and Lake Drive, right there at Goodwin's, Goodwin's Market, and we have been selling uh, pulled pork sandwiches. And in fact, uh, the, our lady who uh, drove the trailer yesterday, your muscle lady over there sitting here this morning, Kimberly, thank you. Uh, but, but we actually been doing pulled pork sandwiches there on the corner. So two weeks ago, there was, there was a lot of noise across the street because there were a whole bunch of Trump supporters that were there with their flags and all. <coughs> then this, this Saturday, there were some other people that were there. They were dressed in, oh, I keep forgetting the name of this, this show again, but uh, it's the Handmaid's, Handmaid's Tale. Tale. Thank you. Uh, and, and there were a couple of ladies that were dressed there like that, and they had Biden, and they had uh, supporters up there, and they had, a, they had, I think, what looked like a skull of Trump, but a, it was something else. Anyways, it was meant to be an effigy of Trump. And so, so we've had now two weeks of politics going on up around us on, on both Saturdays and, and the different groups. And, and it's just interesting, as people are driving by, there's people that are honking, which they're honking in support. Then there's people that do the one finger wave and that happened both weeks as well. And there's just kind of all, have you noticed that we're just in a little bit of a season where there's like a, maybe a need for peacemakers? Maybe a need for peacemakers? <laughs> And I want, I want us to think about that this morning. Who, who is a peacemaker? The word here for peace comes from that, the root word of joining together. So a peacemaker is somebody who helps join people together who might be fighting who might be arguing, who might be at odds with one another. Two countries, when they come together and make a peace treaty, a shalom treaty, they're coming together to say, okay, we're not going to fight each other any longer. We're bringing them together. It's one of the most important things I think you can do is get people together. It's one of the challenges when you do, pre do marital counseling, right? Especially if they've come in and they're already mad. That's a real fun one, right? They're already mad and they're kicked at each other. And what you've got to do is try to get them just to stop, <laughs> And, and that sometimes is all you can do in order to help some people who are fighting. It's just, okay, just stop, okay? And isn't that kind of what you do with a, with, when you have a war? Okay, truce. Nobody shoot. And, and both sides make that promise until one breaks it and then, then they're out there firing again. But, but you st everyone stop shooting for a minute. Boy, we're going to need that November 3 and 4 and 5 and 6. <laughs> I'm not sure how long it's going to go on. But, but the fact is, is that... God has called us to be peacemakers, to be people who join people together, whose relationship is broken, people who are divided, they're, they're opposing one another, and God's called us to be peacemakers. <clears throat> I have an illustration, and, and we'll see whether we understand it or not. Jim Walton is a, is a Bible translator, and he translates the, is, has been translating the New Testament for people called the, the, the Muinani people of La Sabana in the jungles of Colombia. And he was having a problem trying to explain peace and get a word that would fit with peace for the people. They didn't have anything that seemed to fit their language. And while he was working on this, Fernando, the, 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 I guess you would call him the village chief, had been promised a 20-minute ride on a plane that, that would take him normally three days to travel by foot. But he was, and there was a plane coming. 
So, so the, the chief was there waiting. Well, the, finally, the chief decided to leave. The plane hadn't arrived. So the chief leaves, and he's headed out on foot. Now, unfortunately, the plane arrives. I say unfortunately because the plane arrives, and so somebody runs after the chief, gets him, brings him back. Well, by the time he gets back there, the plane's left again. <laughs> so now this chief is like, he's like just a bit upset, okay? ticked off, and in his own language, he's saying some pretty tough stuff. And, and he kept using a phrase, something that, that, that this, he said, <clears throat> he launched into this angry, angry tirade. And, and fortunately, Walton had actually taped, had his tape running, and had taped and recorded what the chief was saying. And he noticed later that when he translated what the chief was saying, he kept repeating, I don't have one heart. I don't have one heart. So he finally, so Jim went and he talked to some other people there at the tribe and said, okay, please help me understand. What is this? I don't have one heart. And, and they explained what this means is that, that they had a saying that there's nothing between you and the other person. In other words, you're broken. You're separated. You're not connected. And suddenly he had his word for peace. Peace is having one heart and use that word to explain reconciliation with God and how Jesus brings us together with one heart. You see, Jesus is our peacemaker. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says, for he himself is our peace. Next slide, Jonathan. Who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its command and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. What's he doing? Jesus. Jesus is making them, making us one heart with God. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. You see, Jesus, what Paul is saying is, Jesus brought these two groups together that weren't, they, they didn't like each other really. And it was the Jews and the Gentiles. And he's broken down the dividing wall of hostility between them now by himself on the cross. And he's offered us all unity of heart, one heart, one heart with God by what he did on the cross. Romans says it this way, chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. In a single word, mankind needed reconciliation with God. And we only get that reconciliation through Jesus, our peacemaker. Jesus who pays the price. Jesus who mediates between us. Folks, um, we, need, we need a lot more peacemakers today. Across this land and really around the world. And I want you to think about this. What, what can you personally do to bring people together? To help people that might be like the Jews and the Gentiles, you know, who might be separated and at odds with one another, and, and to help them get past that dividing wall of hostility and come together and unite. What could you personally do? Might I suggest that you need to begin by realizing that you needed Jesus to come to you to give you peace. You can't do anything to reconcile yourself to God in your own ability. You have to be reconciled by what Jesus Christ did for you. May I also suggest that that should humble you. The fact that you sin, the fact that you sinned before you came to know Jesus, the fact that you sin after you came to know Jesus, the fact that you probably sin today already. I'm sure I have. Well, I know I have. 
Shouldn't that humble us? That Jesus Christ died for us and reconciled us to God and continues to be that bridge of peace for us even though we sin. And shouldn't that humble us enough so it affects then how we relate to one another? This should motivate us to treat. And, let, and notice, 1 John is full of this. And by the fact, I, I encourage you, go home today and count how many times 1 John has the phrase, children of God. Remember, what's the beatitude? Blessed are peacemakers, and they shall be called children of God. Count how many times it talks about children of God in 1 John. Because the first responsibility we have once we come to God is to love one another in the church. Have you noticed that there's some people that still haven't come to worship here in the building with us? Have you noticed that some of the people who come to worship don't want to put on a mask at the door? Have you also noticed that some people who come to worship wear a mask as we're worshiping? Have you noticed that people have different opinions about masks? In the body of Christ. And so one of the reasons why I ask you to wear a mask when you're greeting I ask you to let us take your temperature at the door. There are things that we should do to try to protect one another. I realize there's all kinds of opinions on that. I've been reading all the stuff that says these are causing us sickness. And, and then others, that these are protecting us. The World Health Organization is saying that we no longer should be shutting down stuff. But then others are saying we should be shutting down. There's all kinds of opinions across the board on COVID-19, aren't there? But don't we have a responsibility to figure out how to love one another and not allow whatever our opinion of these is to become the dividing wall of this hostility? So I'm asking you, on behalf of the Lord, to try to figure out how to love one another, how to be a peacemaker even though you may have strong opinions. And I kind of get the feeling almost everybody has stronger feelings about this. Have you noticed? Probably everyone here today has strong opinions and feelings all different ways. But God's called us to love one another. 1 Corinthians 6 says this, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies, whatever that's going to take for you. We have a responsibility to honor God with what we do. Secondly, in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, such an important message and passage that speaks about our responsibility. It lines up with the great commission of Matthew 28, the commission that God gave his disciples just before he ascends into heaven. Jesus said, you're supposed to go into all the world and do what? Make disciples. You're supposed to preach the gospel and disciple people and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to keep doing that and teach them to obey Jesus. And now, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says it this way, for Christ's love compels us. The fact that he's our peacemaker, the fact that he's the one who paid the price for our sin, that love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. We have a responsibility to love one another because that's living for Jesus. And then he goes on. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. By the way, who gets to be excluded from that list of becoming a peacemaker? No one who follows Christ. No one who has been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ is supposed to say, oh, no, I'm not included. 
God is Christ has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What is that? Paul explains it. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So I challenge you not just to be humble by what Jesus has done for you, but I challenge you to pray for reconciliation, to pray for peace. I challenge you to work for peace, to put some energy into it. I, I have a friend who is clearly an atheist, but he's a friend. He's clearly at a different position politically. One of the weeks he was smiling, one of the weeks he wasn't. <laughs> we were down working at the, at the Rotary um, pulled, pulled pork sandwich grill. But he's a friend. He respects me and I respect him. You see, that's, those relationships are what we've got to work on in order to work for peace. And I also challenge you that if you're at odds with somebody, make peace. Jesus has a lot more reason to be at odds with you because you are far from perfect. Make peace with the people around you. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. This is verse 20 in 2 Corinthians 5. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Did you catch what Paul just said there? We are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So the way you are communicating with other people, would you say that it's God's appeal? Would you say that you're communicating the way God wants to communicate with people? Are you appealing to them the way God is? Because what, what Paul's saying is, you're God for that person. It's as if God were right there speaking through you. That ought to put a little bit more of a stronger test on us, shouldn't it? In how we communicate. So in the Sermon on the Mount, later after he gave those first Beatitudes, in, in chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus said this. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and, seeds, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So we are supposed to love our neighbor. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Dear friends, 1 John 4, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Peacemakers are blessed. They're blessed to be God's children. You see, you were personally called by Jesus to come to know him. You've been personally called by Jesus to serve in his kingdom. Because of that, you're a child of the king with, with royal privileges. You get to go into the throne room because you're a child of the king. You are called to be peacemakers, 
to bring reconciliation to people that are around, that are even different than you. So I take you back. If you wear a mask, do you love the person that doesn't? If you don't wear a mask and you think this is all a hoax or whatever other, but I'm not going to use the really bad words, but you just, this is a farce, okay? This is terrible. And you don't wear a mask. Do you love the people that do? And don't forget this. God's children are called to a heavenly banquet. Who are you inviting to go to the banquet with you? That's the ministry of reconciliation. It's an interesting term. You will be called, it says. Scripture is full of callings. You will be called by grace. It's a gift that we receive. We can't earn it. You'll be called through the gospel that you may gain the glory of Jesus Christ. You're, you're called to salvation. You're, the saints are, are supposed to be out calling people. We're brought into fellowship with Jesus Christ as a calling. Jews and Greeks are all called to God. Uh, we're, we're called according to his purposes. We're called to walk worthy, to, to follow him. We are called out of darkness into light. We are called with a heavenly calling. We're, we're called even with a, with a holy calling set apart for him. And we're called to be holy in our behavior. And we're called to inherit an incredible blessing, heaven and all of its treasures. That's, that's a child of the king. When we're called to eternal glory in Christ and we're called to triumph with him in the end. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. It may cost you something to love your neighbor. To be a peacemaker with the person who doesn't wear the mask or the one who does. Or the Democrat or the Republican. To be a peacemaker. It may cost you something. But as children of God, we're heirs. And even as we share in his sufferings, we also share in the glory of Jesus Christ. So we have a song that we're going to end worship with today. The song says, oh, come to the altar. Jesus is calling. Now, the first application of this song is if you don't know Jesus, if you haven't accepted his payment, for reconciling you to God. If, you, if you've not allowed him to forgive you of your sins, then obviously the altar is the place to come, to come to him and, and accept that gift. But folks, I look around the room here, those of you who are worshiping in the room today, I can't see you online, but those of you that are here, you're pretty much all Christians here. So we're going to do this song and you can just sit back and chill because it's not for you, right? Mm. No, you know, Pastor had a different thought, didn't he? You see, Jesus is calling us to humble ourselves. He's calling us to come back to that cross again and to learn to be a peacemaker right now in our world where there's a lot of strife. And as peacemakers, that our first goal ought to be, our mission in life ought to be, am I helping somebody to come to Jesus? You know, churches really ought to be full, and I'm not now talking about the, the regulations and all that. 
Churches ought to be full because we ought to be bringing people who need Jesus. Christians, we need to come to the altar. Virgie Leslie.